Hello everyone and welcome to Kenny Conversation brought to you by Jags, the leader in high performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jags.com for everything and anything for your vehicle. I always pause right here because it's like, how do I introduce somebody that's really done it all? Max Pappas. Max, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Kenny. So Max, you're from Italy and I'd like to be worldly. So please excuse me because I- I excuse you. Thank you. <laughs> Max, how do we say your real name in Italy? My full name? Yeah. Let me see if I can translate first. Okay. Massimiliano is Maximilian. That is beautiful. But I've been asking my dad, why did you call me Massimiliano? You never called me once. I and love it. Actually, he called me that name when he got really pissed. Ma Mass <laughs> Massimiliano. He's like Maximil Massimiliano. So from now on, when I see Max at the race track, I'm going to go, Massimiliano. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in town here. And by the way, I am I'm the backseat driver. <laughs> and, I'm the driver. And Max is the driver. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's where we're at right now. We are in uh, Mooresville, yep. Talbert Point, and this is where Max's company is, MPI. You make incredible steering wheels, and we're going to get there. Uh, you are worldly now. You sell steering wheels, racing steering wheels, car steering wheels, all over the world. But Max, let's, let's start out in Italy just for a little bit. Yeah, what do you want to know? Tell me. I want to know just a little bit about you. Uh, you know, how did you become a race car driver without, you know, years ago somebody said, I'm asking you what time it is, but don't bill me a clock. Just some highlights about from Italy and how you got to America. Yeah. I'm going to try to explain it in my, you know, short and simple way, okay? Usually people that they're born in places where I'm born, they don't become race car driver. Uh, I'm born right on the top of Italy, on the Swiss, almost on the Swiss border, you know, that is, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a place that is similar to North Carolina, uh, but I'm born in 1,200 people village. 1,200 people. Yeah, so I call it village because that's the best way that I can describe. It's a town near a bigger town. But, you know, I'm in born in the city. Yeah. And uh, uh, how everything happened, my dad had a passion for racing, but he had a business, he never raced himself. But we were very fortunate because the next door village, you know, one and a half mile from where we, from where we, from where I was born, there was possible the best engine tuner in go-kart in the world. Go-karts. It, it, it seems like a lot of F1 drivers, all of you over there, is it, is it true that you all start in go-karts? I mean, think about it. You know, we don't have oval tracks. We don't have dirt tracks. And the only thing that I knew how to do it was riding my dirt bike when I was a kid mm. and uh, dreaming about driving a go-kart because that is, uh, that's the closest things to what you have here in America, like a quarter midget, you mm. know, and, uh, and, what I did, you know, I, I still remember when I was around 12 years of age, uh, taking a trip with my bicycle yeah. every day down to see Diego Monbelli, my, my teacher. Yeah. And uh, hold on, you, you had a teacher? Th this guy, there was the, th this guy, I call him teacher because that's how we call maestro. That's how I call Mario Andretti as well. Oh. Maestro means teacher in oh, Italian. Maestro. And, and maestro. You know, he was my teacher of racing and life. So Diego was the engine tuner that was about one and a half mile from my house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, two or three times a week, you know, take my bicycle, go down there, clean it, clean all his uh, race shop. There was a mess because he was a genius, but he had shit everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Geniuses are always messy. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> until this guy took me to the racetrack. Mm. Uh, I convinced him to take me to our local track uh, with a with a cart. We rented a cart. Uh, second time, uh, same things. He made me drive one of his cart, mm. and uh, then I, st I, re I still remember. He went back to my dad and he said, "Sir, I think we need to tell you something." So what? Uh, I mean, I 
with Max, we went to the karting track and uh, he has a God gift. I didn't teach him anything and things were coming to him. Mm. So, and that's how my adventure started. So you, you're in Italy and we're gonna fast forward, obviously, I, I tease Max at Max, we could make a really good movie out of your life. So, so when was the moment uh, you come to America? Yeah. Uh, let me, you know, go backwards a little bit okay. so you understand. Yes. You grow up in Europe, uh, and the only things, you know, back in the day, no, no internet, no nothing. So you had no idea. So the only things you were exposed to is Formula One you only know about Formula One. Absolutely. Like I'm sure when you grow up here, uh, NASCAR, right? NASCAR. Maybe in the car maybe, you know, but like, uh, same things for me. I really didn't even know what else was around the world to race. Right. Uh, so my aim since I was a young kid, F1, F1, F1. Um, I went there in 95, I raced for two years. I raced one year full time and one year I was a reserve driver for Lotus super famous team. Yes. And the long story short, it was uh, every single penny that I, that I made, I spent it to get there. Mm. Uh, when I arrived there, I saw there was no future for a kid like me, you know, with uh, no family background. Uh, and, you know, back then, you know, then we're gonna go back to it. Senna, that was my, was my advisor, my teacher passed away. Okay, hold on. I, I list on Kenny conversation. What I try to do is listen, even though I'm hyperactive. You you said Senna. I'm hyperactive too. You're hyperactive. Yes, sir. But you said Senna. I didn't hear that lightly. Ayrton Senna. Yes, sir. Ayrton Senna was somebody you knew. More than you. Best like, friend. Friend. He, I. I think of of Ayrton like uh, my cousin or my older brother. And why this happened, you, you remember I mentioned you before about Diego, this gentleman, the engine tuner, right. that was uh, one and a half, one, one and a half mile from my house. When Ayrton Senna came to Europe as a kid, 16, 18 years old, he lived in, in the next door village with me because Diego was his engine tuner and they went everywhere around the, the world, for sure in Europe, you know, racing go-kart. And that was the connection you know, I I don't remember exactly, I don't recall exactly when I met Santa because I was still a young kid, you know, but I know that uh, um, what happened, it was, uh, uh, I took uh, uh, an interest in this young kid that was racing Formula 3 because he was uh, uh, mentored by this gentleman and the way that uh, Diego talked about Ayrton, he was like talking about God. You know, I mean, it was like, uh, and, uh, and Senna really was my advisor. He paved the road. Uh, he guided uh, me and my dad in making all the decision. And unfortunately, that's what I, going back to that, uh, to what I told you when I left F1, two years before I made my debut uh, in F1, he passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, my family has no background in racing. I, I, I was alone. So, you know, from there on was uh, a lot of decision that we had to take on our own with very little experience. And uh, uh, that's why as well possible my career took a lot longer to, you know, it was not an easy path. Right, and, and let's just leave it at that. Um, I'm almost exhausted because that was a very intense moment just now. Uh, Ayrton Senna is, is I mean, it, it's kind of equal to Dale Earnhardt Sr. Oh, he's a legend. But, I mean, Ayrton Senna's like... Worldwide known. Worldwide, yes. Um, and there's so much more to say about that, but let, let's come back to but Ayrton. I want to tell, tell you a little story, because I think it's really... I think right. you, are a, you are a person that uh, appreciates stuff like this. Uh, I'm racing in Formula 2. I'm in Silverstone. Um, wow. The week after... Uh, same weekend of Imola, Formula One race. Um, Ayrton dies that weekend. Mm. The weekend after would have been the first time that Formula Two and Formula One would have been on the track at the same time since I raced. Mm. Ayrton never saw me racing there. Darn it. Uh, so I was looking for that moment. 
uh, and I was looking for the moment where he was gonna uh, introduce me to Mr. Frank Williams and uh, the people. Williams? So, yeah. Big and, Formula One team. Yeah, so I'm sharing this with you so that you get it. I go to the next race that was Barcelona Grand Prix and it was my first Formula 2 win. That would have been oh. in front of Senna. But I, I tell this all the time to the people. I, I, it was something like I knew I was not alone. And I won it with like five seconds. That's something that never happened. You know, usually you win a race like that by with a guy right on, on your tail. Yeah. And uh, I want to share this with you because uh, I wanted you to understand a little bit uh, my background, uh, why, what, uh, yeah. and uh, then you can things cut that, it. Things that, things that you made you. Yeah, you know, you, you, you can edit it, whatever you want to edit. No, we're not going to edit anything because this is an incredible story. Because people in America, you know, a lot of people don't travel, Max. And anybody that knows racing knows that, you know, Formula One, Europe, you, you say of these names like Racetrack, Silverstone, Barcelona, these are legendary, like, Things that we, I could never get yeah, but, there. But it's the same things that when you talk about Daytona. Yeah. You know, it's the same, like, we were talking yesterday about <laughs> Monaco, right? Yeah. Monaco is one, and a, one hour and 40 minutes by car from my house. Okay, so. So we jump in the car, we go to Monaco. It's like you, you know, jumping in the car and go to uh, the next dirt track that is nearby. You know, it's the same. So for me, a dream is like to go to Monaco, but you're just saying, no, it's just Monaco. Because you live there, you grew up there, it's, it's not a big thing for you. It's like, the, yeah, I'm sure it's like, uh, you know, Bristol for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I love know, this. People love it, they dream about it. Yeah. But how many hundred times you've been to Bristol? Right, lots. It's Bristol. It's up in the middle of the mountains. Okay, so. So, like, you know, the, what, I, what I really loved is the fact that uh, it's almost like I had two lives. Right. And people you know, one, do. One life uh, over in Europe where I only had this dream, I could see that, you know, I was basically, I only, and then there was this people, you know, uh, the people at Ferrari, uh, that they took me here to US to race uh, in sports car. That's big. Uh, but back then, you know, let, let me try to explain people a little bit, you know. Yeah. Back then in 96, 95, sports car was considered a pension plan. Like uh, the young, my youngest teammate uh, was uh, 50 oh. or 48. So it was Michele Alboreto, the one in F1. So he was what was considered, uh, it's not what is now. You know, basically you race in F1, you race in IndyCar, you've done your part and you go and race sports car. Okay. I was 24 yeah. when I came over. Yeah. So uh, he was uh, very not normal for a kid to go and look at that, especially doing it in America, mm. you know, but I, uh, it was, what happened, you say, when you say that, you know, God has a plan, right? Right. I showed up in Daytona. First of all, when I landed, the McDonald's sign was bigger than my entire village. <laughs> it, was, it was like- McDonald's! Yeah, I, I, I talked to my dad, I remember calling it that. America, everything is gigantic. Really? The track, you know, the, the Daytona, I still remember, you know, when I look back, I was sitting in the grandstand and I, I'm 100% sure that there was Dale, Dale Herner Sr. in the three, it was a black car with a three number, so yeah. it must have been him, yeah. testing there. Wow. And I had no idea what I was looking at. You were getting ready for the Daytona 24. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that is, uh, I left Europe came over here and the new life was born. You know, thanks to Daytona, thanks to that place. Yeah. You know, I uh, I would like you to go back and look at a video that uh, Bob Varsha did with me yeah. in Daytona 24 hour. People didn't even know how to pronounce my name. Yeah, Maximilianos. Yeah, and uh, Bob Varsha is there saying, there are people known to be blinders uh, and they've done amazing things in Daytona, but this kid, Massimiliano Papis. <laughs> Papis. He's driving like Mad Max. Mad Max. I finish the race. I'm second. Your closest ever finish in Daytona 24 hour history back then, or 22nd, whatever. I made up two laps from, you know, in the last three hours. I unlapped myself twice. I finished right behind the leader. And uh, the first things I still remember uh, interview. 
Hey, Max Papis. <laughs> and I went, no. It's Papis. I went, my name is Max Papis. P-A-P-I-S. How dare you mess my name up? It's like people that have the name Michelle. It's one L, two L. People get pissed when you say their names wrong. Okay, so we're in America now. And I'm going to kind of, no notes. We're on the fly here. Yeah, I mean, so what he did, he didn't prepare himself. So no, it's like, a, and we this. But we had to do this. completely improvised. But we had to do this because this was once. I mean, maybe I could come back later. But okay, so you become a three-time IndyCar winner. You run 114 races. You're super competitive. You start becoming world-renowned, even though you're over in America. It's not Formula One, but the name Max Pappas becomes. Very legendary, very popular. Now, you win three races, and what are some of the other, help me, what are some of your other uh, great stats? I mean, the biggest stats and the biggest accomplishment for the, me yes. was uh, being called by Bobby Rahal when he retired oh. to drive the seven car, the Miller light car. That's, That's when I got to know your brother. Yeah. Rusty was Because of Miller Brewing. Yeah, Miller Brewing Company. Yeah. Rusty was driving the uh, Miller Lite, you know, yeah. cup car. Really, yeah. And I still have a poster. Yeah. Uh, on There was on USA Today that said, you know, there is nothing like your first win. Yeah. Except your, I think it was 50th, because I think we won, I won uh, Homestead and Rusty won Bristol at the same time. That's big. And I still have the USA Today. And so the biggest accomplishment for me was uh, uh, being picked up uh, by a legendary person like Mr. Ray. Yes. I mean, it is to talk about, you know, yeah. uh, worldwide uh, known, he is. And continue the legacy. And uh, at the same time, having this relationship with Miller Brewing Company that allowed me to get to know people that were out outside my world. Yeah. Like your brother. Yeah. And, you know, I went to some NASCAR races and... Uh, and that really opened up my eyes. I, I want to I say this. Sometimes when people ask me, what's your biggest accomplishment? Some, you know, sometimes I don't, we, don't, we don't say our wins or, or this or that. No. It's like I'm, I'm still in the sport, the longevity. So you've been in racing your whole life. You've been in racing your whole life. So you're in America. You, know, you run 100 and so IndyCar races. You win the three championships. You drive for Bobby Ray Hall. What happened then? Well, I well I, I, now that you bring it up, yes. I mean, I, I, I see how much success, in my eyes, people look up to you. Uh, I give you, you know, the chair was pulled under my, my, my butt. Mm. Uh, do you remember in the racing league cart, the, the split? Okay, let me say something. Yes. Every driver I interviewed, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Elliot, all the greats, they never talk about the good stuff. And you're doing the same thing right now. You're going right to the negative, and I want to hear it. You're going right to the negative. I finished uh, fourth or fifth in the championship, won three, race, won three races that year. Uh, and basically, Bobby Rayal had to shut down my car because there was a split between, in the, between CART and IRL right. that basically, um, for over a decade destroyed the open wheel. Right, I remember. So, and that would propel me to, to look at anything, everything else. Uh, you know, I never had an agent, you know, that's where I, again, you know, some bad choices on my part, you know, that made me grow, you know. I mean, I thought, you know, that I would have always had a spot uh, in, in, in open wheel. After, after three whatever. wins? Yeah. Three Laguna wins. Seca? Yeah, you know, Homestead on the Oval the yes. first time. You know, lap leader in super speedway. That was the things. That's the things that prized me the most. Because uh, people in NASCAR see me like a road race specialist. Italy, you know, road I, racing. I won my first IndyCar race on Homestead Miami Speedway. Fast. I was on pole at, at Chicago Speedway. So, like these are the things. Anyway, so that moment, uh, you know, basically, the, uh, I there was no there was. N Chem car, cart, whatever it was called back then, you know, went down. IRL started. I was seen like a like a, a like a, a child poster of a, of cart. Mm. IRL didn't want me, mm. you know, because I was, you know, 
I was the child post of court, I found myself with nothing. Mm. You know, I went from being here in 90, in 2001 to zero. I mean, literally nothing, zero. No job, no nothing, no, no income, zero. And uh, that's what I had to reinvent myself. So you, uh, you were a victim of the split. I remember it like yesterday. And you... I was a victim of my own choice too. Okay. You know, I made bad choices that put me in that position. So I don't like to be a victim. Yeah. You know, I, I know that I played part in the, in the outcome of that. I don't like excuses. And that's what makes a champion. <laughs> you, 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 you know, because you, you straighten that out. Uh, racers tend to be, I'll kick your ass. I'm never a victim. I win everything. And I like that about you, Max, because you, you got such badass nicknames because you are a fighter. So, okay. So we're in America. You do the Indy car. You go through the split. How in the world did you make it to NASCAR? I was uh, under contract with Corvette Racing. Corvette. So yeah. after my IndyCar stuff, I landed and I went back to what was my route. You know, I ran the 24 hour, I told you, the yeah. first time I came here. And after that, every year, I went to Daytona and I ran the 24. I was fortunate enough to win it twice. That's big. Yeah, I was, you know. That's two times two, two Daytona 24 hour winner. Yes, sir. Max Pappas, that's <laughs> badass. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's alright. You can pause for a little bit. That's that's. Uh, you got two watches. Yes. You got two three, three watches because I, I won uh, the IMSA championship where they give you a watch. You should have those on display here. <laughs> I have a, a plastic watch. <laughs> he got a plastic watch. That that's awesome. Okay, so NASCAR. I was under contract with Corvette Racing. Um, I. I've been always, uh, I maybe my arrogance, I don't know, call it whatever you want to call it, you know. I wanted to... I say love for life. Yeah, I wanted uh, to race a car on my own, not sharing it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I wanted to race at the highest level in America. Yeah. And... Uh, when I was racing for Corvette racing, I kept looking and having an opportunity to, uh, I wanted to see what NASCAR was. So GM Corvette, GM uh, Hendrick Motorsport, uh, the car of tomorrow, COT comes in, mm -hmm. they start testing the COT, and uh, I go to Hendrick Motorsport and I pester them. Uh, actually, Doug Ducard, there was the guy who hired, I know Doug. who hired me in Corvette racing, became, was involved in that thing. So I ended up, uh, you know, developing the car of tomorrow for road courses mm. for Mr. Hendrick. That's when I started to get to know the NASCAR folks. It, that's, that's some really good people to know first. M Mr. Rick Hendrick, you, d you did good right there. Yeah, and uh, I mean, he was... I always had this admiration for them, you know, Talladega Nights, oh, yeah. and uh, I, I, you know, Days of Thunder. Yeah. Uh, so I knew, I, I mean, I watched every movie. I mean, he, for me, NASCAR was always, uh, you know, NASCAR equal America for me. I get NASCAR it. NASCAR equal America. So I wanted to see what was the American dream. I, I just want to say something. For all of you kids out there, or anybody that, doubts NASCAR. We, we all know that NASCAR is still awesome, but but when you came to America, you're just now, you're just telling us right out, NASCAR was like, Amer that was America. I mean, it was bigger than life. But NASCAR is America, you know. It's, See? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, From Italy. Yeah, NASCAR represents what America is. That is you so know, awesome. I always say, uh, you know. I got goosebumps. Yeah, hot dog and beers. Hot dog. <laughs> I'm only laughing because I know you had to learn that being from Europe and and. I always say like you know my previous life was cheese and crackers. Oh yeah, cheese and cra wine. <laughs> cheese and you know cheese and crackers and wine and and I learn how to like hot dog and beers. Yeah, so you get to Hendrick and you're helping develop this uh, car of tomorrow. Let, let, let's rephrase it. 
they're help, they're giving me a shot at testing the car. I'm not helping them. I'm just driving the car. You're so humble all the I'm time. Just, I'm just driving the but, car. But they trusted you driving the car. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, and from there, I mm, I walk the garages. I talk to people. Um, what I remember, it was uh, the hundreds of calls, uh, literally hundreds of calls I made to Ray Abraham mm -hmm. when he owned the Dodge. Yeah. For him to take me testing on an oval in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And I think I pestered him so much that one day I got this call from Annie, his uh, assistant. <laughs> Mr. Abraham is inviting you to go and test uh, the Dodge you know, car in Kentucky together with Bill Elliott. Mm. And, and was, you both are the same height. And I was like, say, Bill Elliott? I mean, like, Mr. Bill Elliott? Yeah. And... That's I'm, close to Ayrton Senna, but not as great. But no, that's, I mean, Bill Elliott's the man, but... I mean, I can tell you this, you know. People at Everham Motorsport, I think it was called then, they were concerned that the crew chief would have had a hard time to understand me. <laughs> you um, got, well, the thing of it is, and then, and then I, you're over here. <laughs> I, I had a hard time understanding awesome Bill from Dawson Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing of it is, is Ernie and Dan are back at the shop. And then I learned to love the guy. And you know, anyway, yeah. you know, so, so I'm you, sharing this because uh, I had to build my career and I don't know if it's, if it's because of lack of talent, lack of whatever. I had to really walk the street and walk the garages to get opportunities. Uh, the one I had, you know, I felt I did the best I could with the God gift that I had. Uh, one of them was, uh, the, you know, joining uh, the Hendrik Motorsport to do all this testing for them and finally get a chance uh, uh, to race a road course uh, for Haas. Uh, I don't remember when exactly, but I raced in Sonoma yeah. uh, with, uh, with Briggs as a teammate. And, uh, and there I continue to put seeds on the ground. And uh, you know, for some people things uh, happen easier. For me, I had you know, things you, that you ran happens, about, so. you ran about 11 Xfinity races with four top tens. That's, that's pretty damn good for somebody coming from Europe, a village, making it across the pond. You, you realize the American dream, even though everything's hard for you, uh, you're, you're saying everything's hard for you. I admire you because, you know, you do something that is very hard to do. You're against all odds. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm gonna try to picture this, okay? Yeah. You know, and so that you guys understand when they say why open wheel guy sucks in NASCAR. I, it's hard. It's no, different it's, discipline. It's like uh, why a football player is not a good soccer player. Right. Mm, I'm gonna try to to share this with you so that even the guys at home understand. Yeah. That it's not one is more difficult than another. They are different disciplines. Yeah. The only things that they are make them common is the fact that it's a car with four wheel. Uh, I show, basically, IndyCar, uh, Super Speedway, Fontana and uh, in Michigan, our two Super Speedways. Mm -hmm. I was lap leader in Super Speedway. I loved it, you know, l led a lot of laps. 230 mile an hour? Two, uh, qualified the 241 average. 241. Oh. And I wrecked the 245 in turn one at Fontana as well. But anyway, that's a different story. That takes my breath away. <laughs> that is incredible speeds. But again, I want to go to that later because uh, it's... Uh, uh, I show up in Michigan, the track that I felt I knew it inside out, yeah. right? I show up with a stock car. Stock car. I couldn't hit my ass. <laughs> You're driving a taxi cab now. No. <laughs> Stock cars. But the, let me explain you why. How I, at least how I look at it. Sorry, you know, I don't know, I don't want to sound arrogant, I'll explain you why. But my brain, you know, told me that the turn one and two in Michigan 
is uh, wide open, almost wide open. I had to feel a certain things. And when I showed up there that I had to let off at the 150 marker. Yeah. Mm, my brain did not think that that was the way that a car should have been driven. Mm. I think that, uh, and I'm, I know maybe we're going on a tangent. Here, no, no. I'm, um, if I would be a cup team owner and I would want to try something different, I would call the world rally champion and i would put him in a cup car mm, okay. before calling the formula one world champion understood big body car similar speed no, no because your brain is yeah speed my brain uh, was ready for 245 in conditioned that uh, uh, when i see turn one braking zone at uh, watkins Glen. My breaking point is 50. <laughs> it's not 600. <laughs> yes, yes. That's funny. I'm sorry. That's no, funny. No, no, no. I get it's it. It's not 600. And even if I push myself, it will never be... My brain has been conditioned for so many years that will not make me think that 600 is the first thing that I should do. Yeah. Maybe 400. Yeah, that will be that will still be two hundred feet too deep. Yeah, <laughs> you're going way in. Stock car. So yeah, the, I'm sharing this with you, and I think with the people at home as well listening yeah. to make them understand how different and difficult it is. And that's why people that even had a lot more talent than me, like Montoya, they struggle tremendously yeah. because it's not natural. Right, it's not natural for what we consider natural. Maybe. For someone that grew up, uh, you know, dirt racing, or uh, you know, uh, or something uh, that super slick, whatever, you go to a to you go to a stock car and it's almost a step up. You know what I mean? You know, a step up in turmoil. It sticks more. Oh, I can break deeper. I can do that. For after doing all the things I did, it was uh, uh, very difficult for my brain. To understand how to do it. Yeah, I get it. And uh, the racing was amazing, the best racing I ever had. Yeah, but even the way you race is completely different. That's why, you know, maybe we went on a tangent, but I think it's no. important for people to understand how different and difficult it is. And I don't know if I was able to explain. Yeah, it you were, be because like when we've had the greatest World of Outlaw sprint car drivers. Whether it's Slam and Sammy Swindell or you know Steve Kinzer, when they came to NASCAR, it was hard for them. You know, and, and I feel like if you're going to be really good at something, you got to start very young and you got to stay there. Everything is so fast, so specialized now that yes, you explained it perfectly. Okay, so we're in NASCAR, and be, because this cannot be a two-hour show, this cannot be a two-hour show. It can be. Let's edit it. Let, let, let's just say that, okay, you've had your NASCAR career, and there's a couple things I want to cover. I want to cover you becoming uh, one of the greatest driver coaches of our era, but I also want to cover MPI. I think one of your greatest achievements in your life. It's business, you know, but... Let's, let's go to William Byron and you. Be, because here lately, they couldn't say William Byron's name without saying your name. You become this driver coach, life coach, somebody the driver can communicate. When was the very first time that this kind of just crept up on you? Who was the driver? And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I'm helping a driver. I would say that uh, you mentioned before, I, I was uh, uh, in RCR racing road courses and uh, Austin and Ty Dillon uh, were developing the track series, I think they were racing. And I remember uh, Richard Childress uh, asking me, hey, 
can you oversee Austin and Ty on the road course? Mm. Because so, he knew you were a good road racer. Although I won my first IndyCar race on an oval. That's, <laughs> that's okay. They thought highly of you, yeah. being a road racer. Yeah, I was very proud. Are you hard on yourself? Uh, very. That's why I'm interjecting a little bit. You're too, I think you're too hard on yourself. But that's okay, because we all are. So, okay. So, Childers chooses you because you're a badass on road courses. I, I'm racing for him in Xfinity, try to win... Mm, uh, my, I had a dream and a goal of being the first Italian after Mario Andretti to win a NASCAR race. Badass. And uh, so I'm trying to achieve my goal, and at the same time, I'm there, you know, if you want to call it teaching or helping Austin and Ty to get better on road courses. Then I go to s uh, some oval races, and I find that, that I have a God gift. I can look at the car, and I can see from the outside what's happening. And maybe because of all the struggle and all the things I had to go through, uh, I improved my way of communicating or I, uh, I saw what could have been done better in communicating. And I found myself, uh, you know, starting with, hey Austin, uh, besides the breaking zone in turn one, uh, this is what I hear you say to your crew chief, A, B, C. Is this what's coming out? He goes, no, Max, I want to say D-E-F. You know, wow. So let's try to make sure, say, this is what, how I would have done it. This, you know, because I hear A, B, C, but you want to say D-E-F. All right. And that, in short, was uh, what I learned that was my gift. You know, being able to uh, pass on what I learned and... Uh, would you just say that people now look at me, I call myself performance advisor. Perfect. Because coach, you know, you cannot, you know, obviously speed come from God. You can coach and advise people on other stuff, but not speed. Uh, and this is maybe what led later on, you know, JGR, uh, Joe, you know, Joe Logano was there. Again, I go there testing the road course car. Joe is, is uh, Joe Logano. Uh, Zipadelli, they want to improve their relationship. We start the same, the same way. Hey, test my road course car, make it better, whatever. And then we find ourselves, uh, hey, Joe, you know, how, how, hey, Joy, how is it with, uh, with Zipadelli? How are you going to, and, and Zippy talked to me, blah, blah. we've created this relationship. And all of a sudden, out of all of this, one day this blonde kid shows up at the office uh, this blonde kid is William Byron. William Byron shows up to you. He's 16 years old. He heard from me from the PR person of Joey Logano. Mm. Uh, he comes over and they say, Max, you know, I'm, you know, I'm doing this, this, and this, and this, you know. Uh, and that what you see, the relationship, this, uh, what I call project, mm -hmm. started... Uh, about eight years ago, mm. and we developed into a team of one. Wow. Uh, I love to say that uh, I learned tremendous from William, and at the same time I passed on uh, everything I could uh, uh, see that could have been, that was excellent, and everything that could be improved, and uh, and the best way that I can say it would be, I think if you would have had you when you were 25. Mm. Oh my gosh. You now. I sorry, wish. Oh, 25. yes. Well, I always say we live life backwards. Uh, you know, if I could put my 50-year-old brain in my 20-year-old self, yeah, so I get it because I would be smarter, quicker, right? Up the, so you're taking your old age wisdom and you're giving it to William right away. Oh, I did this wrong, so don't, here, let me tell you what. But as well, I, this is what I learned. You see, I'm hard on myself. You told yeah, me, right? yeah, yeah. You're, you're saying he's teaching you, but in your own. No, awesome. no, but I'm, I learned that, uh, you know, praise the nine things that you do right, right, and then criticize the one you don't do right. 100. Don't always hammer on what you don't do right. I agree. And uh, what I felt, uh, uh, this adventure with William started, hey, let me go, uh, I start going with him to uh, the late model races, you know, understanding, you know, listening to him. 
And the only things that I can say that I contributed is for him to be the best William Byron he could be. At a young age. And he's 24 years old. He has a, a half, basically, he just passed a 200 NASCAR race uh, mark. If you look at it, at Har such a young age, I mean, Harvick retired with 800. Yeah. Kyle Busch or, you know, has 600, I believe. Um, uh, Chase Elliott, that is there, almost five, 400, 500. So William is relatively young in terms oh, of race young. experience. And uh, so if there is something that I feel that we created, I, I pride myself uh, that I've always been there for him. He could lean on me. Yeah. Uh, as uh, a friend, as an advisor, and as someone that always shoot him really straight, uh, both on what was on track or not. And the pride that I have is that I seen him developing and needing me less and less and less and less, and that's amazing. I, when I, my goal is making sure that Uncle Max can go to the track from time to time yeah. and just see this amazing young talent winning races. And I think that we are at that stage where he's a man now, he's a, you know, he almost won the cup championship. And if I, if I can interject, uh, if I've done something, whatever the little things that I've done for him, uh, it's, it prides me a lot because I know that uh, I might have maybe helped him uh, to reach that goal a little quicker than if he would have just been on his own. Uh, but again, you ask me, people see you like this uh, coach. It happened. Uh, he, I didn't, he's not a business. And I just... Uh, it, it kind of fell in your lap. You didn't mean for it to happen. No, but I felt... People called you. It's almost like you. Like, you know, did you know that you were that good at doing this uh, TV stuff or this movie stuff? It fell in my lap. You know, it fits yeah. who you are. Right. And uh, uh, the things that I think is very important that I want to really be clear is that um, mm, I, I want to make sure that people understand, you know, he, William, he would have done everything he has done even without me. 100%. Mm -hmm. It would have might maybe take a little longer or maybe make a little bit more mistake or maybe, you know, be like Max now at 54 years of age that uh, uh, understand things that he should have understood when he was 30. Yeah. So, like, the goal here is understanding his God gift, you know, because I think it's really important that people, because sometimes I read on the, on, on the, when I post something, you know, I read comments like, uh, oh yeah, for sure he did it, you know, because you told him, no, no, I didn't, you know, he did it all on his own. Mm. I was just there, three steps behind, if, if I was needed. Yeah. And the moment sometimes uh, when you are needed is the most important moment, mm. because uh, you've been many times alone, mm. and that's not a good feeling. Let, right? me, let me just say this, I wished I would have had you back in 1999, 2000, because when I went to drive for Andy Petrie, he crushed me. He said, you really explain the car in a different, unique way. You're, in, in other words, what, what I heard was, Kenny, you're explaining the car in such a bad way that we don't know how to fix it. I wished I'd have had somebody like you because I felt like I was on an island all by myself. Kenny's so messed up because he can't, like, if I was loose, I'd say, well, when I get in the corner, I'm, I'm turning the wheel right because I'm loose on entry. And, th and then I'm pushing in the middle. M now that I'm older, I'm like, you know, if I, if I tighten it, if I'm not turning right, I wish I'd be turning left and then there'd be no push. I wish I'd have had you because you could have helped clean that up. You could have went to Andy and, and helped me. And you're, you could have said, here's what Kenny means because I'm, you're a race car driver and you knew what I meant. Uh, I, I, Where were you for me? <laughs> I, I, I was too young. Yeah, you were. And I'm 60. And, and I was learning on my own. So, Max, I'm we... I'm still learning. So, listen, we, we... Like I say, I just... You know, it's so much ground... I hope that this is not too boring for no, no, people no, no, no. listening. No, we, we can edit it up, make it exciting. So, let, let's move now to MPI. 
Okay. I know the story because you told me. How did how did these incredible steering wheels that are worldwide, the famous Dayglo Orange, I love this orange, it's so exciting. And I know you sell quality wheels. They're the best steering wheels in the world. What made you do Sometimes that? Sometimes we, we sell old do, but gold. Well, you know what? Let's just let's just start right there. Tell me about this steering wheel. <laughs> Let me feel it. First thing I noticed is it's thinner on the bottom. Yes. Yeah. So okay. this this is the first of all. If I don't know if you guys know. Yeah, this. go ahead. This Kevin is, Kevin Harvick. Yeah. This is the wheel that was in uh, Kevin. It, it, we made two. This uh, was this other wheel, exactly like the one that was in Kevin Harvick last race at Phoenix. You made every st steering wheel in it, this year? In his last season, because Kevin is one of the closest friends that I have, I told him, I'm going to make you a gift, that, that something that you can carry with you all your life. I'm going to make an MPI steering wheel for each of your last uh, race of the season. So he had a new steering wheel every single race? 38 races. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in the last one I surprised him and Delena and I you know I didn't tell him nothing and I say uh, you know what in Italy what we say old but gold I love it and this was the old but gold uh, wheel so but basically you know this is an evolution this is what Kevin helped me to design it's a flat on the bottom so it stays away from the belt buckle cuz he likes his wheel low yes sir and uh, is scalloped at the top so you can see the dashboard. Ah, be darned. Yeah, so these are all little, you know, details. Idiosyncrasies is what I call them, little things. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm like, did you learn that on the vocabulary? My brother Rusty would say, Herm, I see you doing that TV, you're using some fancy words. <laughs> That's really interesting, though, because it says to all these young kids out there, a steering wheel is not a steering wheel. No, it, you know, I. I'm gonna, you know, cause I don't want this to sound like an infomercial, you know, but. Uh, it's okay, how did MPI start? How MPI started, I was driving a stock car. I was testing a stock car. I had an accident. Uh, we were using a, a, what was uh, considered the everyday steering, but I don't remember the brand or whatever. I broke my wrist mm. because the wheel was so rigid that all the load came. I never left the steering wheel go because I drove it all the way to the wall. And I broke my wrist. Mm. Uh, talking with my NASCAR friends, I, 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 I told them, guys, if this happened with you guys, you know, you're in trouble. You're going to be out of the car for like three, four weeks. You know, think about how you're done. You know? Yeah. And let me think about it. You know, so what I did, I went back to Italy. I consulted with a friend of mine. And uh, we analyzed what was in the, in why I hurt myself. And we understood that basically the wheel that I used was it almost took a thousand pounds to, to bend. Wow. So the, the wheel never bent, boom, load came in. Uh, together with Terry Trammell, the, 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 our Terry IndyCar, Trammell, legendary doctor. Yeah, IndyCar doctor. IndyCar. Uh, and doctor, let's, let's put it this, motor racing doctor. The guy that helped all of us uh, to be in one piece now. Together with Terry Trammell, and uh, my crazy ideas and some people in Europe, we came up, you know, we studied uh, and NASCAR, obviously that's very important because I work with John Patelak and the people in the NASCAR R&D to help me to develop this. We learned that uh, how much load the wheel had to have uh, in order to protect the driver. So we created this steering wheel and uh, I still remember before coming up with all the idea, uh, when we were starting, everyone used to have an, a yellow stripe on top of yeah, the Yeah, well, very, very important. For, sorry to grab the wheel from you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, th this is important because I want to be centered up. Yeah. And okay. So, uh, everyone used to have a yellow stripe. Yeah. Not, don't ask me why, I don't know. So, I always uh, like to go to the, to the best. And I went to Mr. Richard Petty. The, the king. The king. And I asked, hey, Richard. Uh, what do you remember of your steering wheel when you run? And uh, and he came up, he told me this story that I, I believe, I, I don't want to say something wrong, I don't know, 67, 69. He told me, I spun in Daytona in the infield. I couldn't get going again because I couldn't see where my wheel was, if it was up or down, whatever. I went back to the shop and I took a piece of orange duct tape and I put it right in the middle. And I went... 
Richard, may I use that ah, for my go. product? And that the reason why the orange marker is. That's an incredible it, story. RP. And uh, when he won this 200 races, I gave them, I created a special steering wheel with the orange stripe and he, he's a funny person, he told me, I should have asked for a commission for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so MPI started to protect and, and make the driver better. Yeah, And well uh, done. And we went from there, you know, building, maybe selling things from my garage, 10 steering wheel, 20 steering wheel, whatever, until drivers start to really realize what was happening. And I believe that what changed was uh, um, two moments that were, you know, pretty radical. Uh, uh, Brett Kozlowski in a crash at Watkins Glen, where his wheel pretzeled up, mm. and Cal Bush at uh, Daytona. Daytona. Uh, when he crashed super hard, uh, he, he broke his leg. In the Xfinity car. Yeah, uh, yeah and uh, and basically, I don't. He didn't hurt himself on the top, and the wheel was all you know basically deformed as it should have been. And I think that slowly, uh, I hope that you know the, that uh, people slowly start to see that this was not just a pretty product; it was actually something that was helping the sport. Right, and uh, and that was the beginning of, the, of an adventure that uh, I mean now we uh, we are still the going, but you know I like to say that we are the USA market leader for racing, and the pride is that uh, we use this technology that I told you, my technology, what I learned, yeah, and we apply it to dirt racing, drag racing, quarter midget, and my pride is that. Uh, there is a second life besides racing. Yes. And uh, uh, I found that, you know, that's... Uh, 100%. You know, it's like... A, Look at you smile. Yeah. And together with that, we are helping a lot of kids. And, I, and, and what it does, it keeps me young. Yes. Because what I do, I can go to the quarter midget race. I can see the young new talent. I see you at the up. Chili Bowl. Yeah. Chili it Bowl. amazes me. Because uh, look at this Italian at the chili bowl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that I'm more country than you are. Oh yeah. Hey, I told Max. I said, Max, you're so ch he's in really good shape. And I said, I got a little bit of a belly. Max says, Well, that's because you're from Missouri. And I'm like, Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> but the chill. Yeah, you're everywhere. But that it gives me a new joy of life. Yeah. You know, I'm there getting to know the people. I got to know this uh, young kid, uh, Brent Cruz. Yeah. One of the best, one of, is going to be a superstar in the future. That's how I got to know um, William, you know, like, uh, uh, and many other kids, you know, many other people that now they are up there. And it prides me because uh, we are helping the sport, we're creating a business, and, uh, uh, and it's something that grows on its own because uh, uh, basically we are servicing the sport. Now, uh, we need to figure. We are figuring out how to take what we learn outside racing mm -hmm. to make it, uh, uh, you know, a more valuable business. If you want to call well, it. Well, I think you've done an incredible job. You you brought in your experiences where the steering wheels were too strong. You figured out where they needed to be. Max, listen. Uh, let's end like this. Uh, I know how much you love Ayrton Senna, uh, and I walked into your office and I about I about lost my breath. You can we show uh, it, it's out of camera. This is incredible. So here it is. Tell me about this Ayrton Senna helmet. I think we touched it, you know, before. This is still, yeah, you know, these Maximilianos, um, yeah, with Ford Maximiliano with friendship by Ayrton Senna, Monza 90. Monza, yeah, that's my home track. That's near Gosh. again. And there's his signature. Uh, yeah. And uh, do you remember I told you about uh, our maestro, our teacher? Yeah, That teacher. was the mechanic, the karting engine tuner nearby. Right. Um, from that moment, when I was 12, 14 years old, Ayrton took uh, a, an interest in me. Mm. Obviously, he was my idol mm -hmm. because uh, when I was in, in go-kart, he was already in Formula 3. Yeah. Then uh, it was always like, you know, up. And uh, what he did for me, 
he, he was my performance advisor. Yes. Oh know. my gosh. Isn't that right? They say life comes in a full circle. Well, listen, everybody, uh, as I always say, please like and subscribe. Remember, we are in podcast form, iTunes, Spotify, obviously, we're right here on YouTube. But Max, um, I love you. Your story is incredible. Not everybody comes from Italy and makes it into NASCAR. Um, thank you so much for being on Kenny Conversation. Kenny, it's been my pleasure. And more than my pleasure is getting to know a special person like you are. Stop it. All right, everybody. Until the next Kenny Conversation, we'll just keep on rolling.